Yep, awesome. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be covering GP emergencies, MSK, and OSCE tips. Um, as the OSCEs are pass fail only, I won't go too much into the OSCEs, maybe the last five minutes only. Um, I'll focus a lot on MSK because there's quite a few multiple choice questions they can ask on MSK. Um, in terms of the structure, um, these are the sort of topics we're going to cover. In terms of the GP emergencies, we'll go through AMI, asthma, anaphylaxis, which are probably the three big ones, and then snake bites and mandatory reporting. MSK, we'll do back pain and osteoarthritis in detail. And then I've got MCQs on a lot of the other MSK conditions that they like to ask about. Um, and we'll sort of teach them through the MCQ style. And then OSCEs, as I said, just the last five minutes, we'll go through Murtagh's model and some general advice of how to pass GP OSCEs. So I guess that's all that really needs to happen. Okay, so moving on to emergencies. The first one is an AMI. Um, the very simple management for AMI is step one is always call the ambulance and refer to ED if so if a heart attack type presentation presents to the general practitioner. When an exam question based on this, it was, you know, central crushing chest pain, radiating to the left arm, nausea, sweating. What's the first thing to do? Um, and all four of these were options. So I think it, it's tempting because in your mind, you know, you always know give IV morphine, give oxygen if the saturation is less than 92, give aspirin, GTN. So it's tempting to pick one of them. Uh, but the first answer should always be in any situation where you have an AMI, call an ambulance, refer to ED. Um, next is IV morphine. I've put IV in bold because in one of the questions in the past, they have had morphine, but they've had oral and IV and you had to choose between them. If the patient is allergic to morphine, you can also give fentanyl. Um, again, that's sort of the second line preferred, I guess, is morphine. Oxygen only if saturation is less than 92, so not for all patients. Aspirin, GTN, again, just to help in the acute setting before they hopefully go off to the cath lab if it isn't STEMI. Next is asthma. So there's sort of two ways to think about asthma. <clears throat> there's a community first aid perspective and there's the more detailed perspective. For GP, I think all you need to know is the community first aid perspective, which is four by four by four. And I think this is quite useful for OSCEs as well, because there's a good chance you get an OSCE counseling station. You know, how do you use an inhaler? What do I do if there's an emergency and I can't breathe? So I think it's important you understand quite well what the four by four by four means. So very simply, it's you give one puff, let them take four breaths, and then do that four times. So four total puffs, that's one cycle per se. Wait four minutes, and then do it again. Um, you call the ambulance after the second puff, so sort of the second set of four puffs, and you keep going every four minutes until the ambulance arrives. The, there is a more complicated way to treat asthma, I guess, more for a hospital setting where there's like an acronym, oh shit, man. So you give oxygen, salbutamol, hydrocortisone. But I think that's potentially too complicated from a GP perspective because a GP probably going, isn't going to be able to do all of that or have all of that medication in a GP clinic. So more likely than not, what a GP would probably do is the four by four by four, especially if it's not sort of a multi-centered GP clinic, and then call an ambulance and wait for the ambulance to arrive. For pediatrics, for your exam, you do need to know the complicated flow chart, and I recommend the asthma handbook for that. Um, and you sort of need to know every step of that cycle and also probably the doses. So how much salbutamol do you give? How much steroid do you give? For GP, I think this is all you really need to know, and I think it's quite simple as well. But I'd practice counselling it in an OSCE perspective. Next one is anaphylaxis. So first of all, what is anaphylaxis? I think the stereotype of anaphylaxis Anaphylaxis is like, you know, the tongue is swollen, you've got a rash, you've eaten a peanut. And that, that's kind of, like, I guess, the idea of anaphylaxis in an exam setting. Essentially, anaphylaxis is where there's any systemic involvement of two or more body systems. So dermatological system is quite common. You've got the rash, the hives, respiratory, so you can get airway edema, which is why you have the difficulty breathing air in. Nausea or vomiting and cardiac tach tachycardia or hypertension, again, are quite common as well. I think in an exam setting, they'll make it quite obvious that it's anaphylaxis as opposed to an allergic reaction. And obviously the management for the two are very different. So it's important when you're thinking about it from an exam perspective or even an OSCE that you clearly differentiate, is this allergy, which is not necessarily a medical emergency, or is it anaphylaxis, which needs emergency management? In terms of the management for anaphylaxis, I think in this particular setting, knowing the doses is important. I know um, for Abhishek was saying for the majority of GP, the doses aren't relevant. I'd agree with that. I think for anaphylaxis, it's important to know. And also, I guess, important to know the pediatric dose as well, because anaphylaxis comes up in your PEDS exam too. So I put the table there. I think the main ones to memorize are adult 12 and over. Memorize that sort of volume, the 0.5 mLs. And I think 
for the paediatrics one, it's good to have just a rough idea of what the rest of the table is as well. In terms of what to do aside from the adrenaline, so first step in any GP emergency, call the ambulance because they've got to go to hospital for further management and monitoring. You then can lie them down or sit them up. Different sources recommend different things, but essentially positioning the patient in a comfortable place and then straight away giving intramuscular adrenaline, usually through an EpiPen. And you know most GP practices would have an EpiPen. A lot of patients also bring their own EpiPen or carry it with them all the time. If possible, you know you can do things like monitoring and get IV access for fluids and you know hemodynamic support. In a GP setting, some may be able to do that. Some may not have the facilities to do that. So again, I put those two points there more sort of as what you would consider if you could do, but they're not the classic GP management. I think one to four is really the bread and butter of what you'd be expected to know for an exam or an OSCE. I think also remembering that it's every five minutes you give the second dose of adrenaline um, until obviously the ambulance arrives or more help arrives. And then they're taken to hospital and they're managed in hospital in a much more, I guess, controlled environment. Next is snake bites. I don't know why they like asking about it, but they do. Um, again, step one, call the ambulance. This time the position is more clear. So you lie them down and put a compression bandage on whichever limb is impacted. So if it's on the arm, you put the compression bandage on the arm as tight as possible without stopping circulation and as going high up the limb as possible, again, without stopping the circulation if possible. And it's always good to check cap refill and just feel if the hand is cold to see if the compression bandage is on a bit too tight. Next step is a splint, which just stops with immobilization. Basically, you don't want the arm to move around a lot or the leg to move around a lot because that can spread the toxin to other parts of the body through the blood. So you want to keep the arm still, keep it compressed and wait until the ambulance comes. If you have more time and if the patient you know, is able to talk without too much distress, you can ask just a couple of questions about, did you see the snake? Do you know what type of snakes are common in the area you were in? Sort of just to get a bit of an idea so that when they do get to hospital, some sort of anti-venom may be pre-prepared or if not pre-prepared, they might have a better idea of what to look for and what sort of things to consider once they're in hospital. Um, these are a list of common don'ts. Um, I think there's a lot of stereotypes about what maybe to do when you have a snake bite. So I guess just remember that you don't do any of these things. I think a lot of them are just common sense, but good to know and keep in the back of your mind of what not to do. The last emergency I have is reporting violence. Um, whether or not it's an emergency, I don't know. Like it's probably not what the classic GP emergency in the setting. It's not like an AMI, but I put it in because obviously it's a very serious issue and also it's a very examinable issue. We had two multiple choice questions on what to do when someone comes with violence to the GP setting. So I think it's really important you're comfortable dealing with both of these scenarios. With the child abuse situation, irrespective of what the child wants and what potentially their carer or guardian wants, you have to report it to the Department of Health. So that's not, you know, there's no gray areas there. If any case of suspected or actual child abuse as a GP, the obligation is to report. That's a little bit different to domestic violence where the reporting decision isn't the GP's choice, it's the victim's choice. So if the victim wants you to report the situation, then of course the GP can report the situation. But if the patient says no, that they don't want to report the situation, the GP is not legally able to report that situation against the patient's wishes. So I think it's important that there's a very clear difference in how the two situations are dealt with. And we had a multiple choice question on both. And I think the reason they put those types of questions in is obviously this is a very serious topic. And I think it's important that we know what to do when confronted with either scenario. So just remember this kind of slide, I think is quite important. Okay. Moving on to MSK. Uh, before I do that, does anyone have any questions about any of the emergencies? If you do, feel free to send a message. Um, so someone's written in the chat, is it technically anaphylaxis if a patient has nausea plus vomiting as well as tachycardia? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think from an exam perspective, like it'll be obvious that it's anaphylaxis. And I think usually with anaphylaxis, there's probably a trigger, right? They've either had a medication or they've had food, et cetera. And I think like it's pretty obvious when the scenario is anaphylaxis. I think nausea plus vomiting and tachycardia is probably something that's seen in you know, a lot of different conditions. For example, if you're sick with a gastro bug, you might have nausea and vomiting plus tachycardia. So I would say that's not necessarily anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is usually multi-systemic involvement in response to a trigger. Um, and someone's also asked me, what is, uh, for anaphylaxis, how many times do you re redo the adrenaline? I think usually a good thing to keep in mind is redo the adrenaline every five minutes until an ambulance arrives. Um, and usually when you tell an ambulance operator it's anaphylaxis, there's generally 
understood that there's an emergency situation happening and they come quite quickly. I think also a lot of the cases that you see, the anaphylaxis, preferably, I guess, resolves after the first injection of, of the adrenaline. Um, and particularly from an OSCE exam perspective, I think it's good to know that repeat it every five minutes. And after that, I think that's sort of enough for a GP perspective. Okay, so we might move on to MSK. Um, the way I'm going to go through the MSK is I've got a lot of multiple choice questions. Um, they're all sort of things they could ask you in an exam. So I think they're all reasonably representative. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if anyone wants to volunteer um, to sort of turn their mic on and sort of tell me what they think the answer is and a little bit of a justification. And then I'll go through the explanation. And for every question, hopefully someone different volunteers. So yeah, anyone can feel free to turn their mic on and have a crack at this one. All right, um, if no one volunteers, I might get people if they're more comfortable to write in the chat what they think the answer might be and briefly explain it in the chat. Um, and I might also just call on some people I know who are in the chat, so let's see. Yeah, so someone said E in the chat. Yeah, a few people have said E, someone said B. Yeah, so I think E and B are obviously probably the most common answers in this particular situation. Um, that's good. So I think in this one, the answer here is E. This is a very common exam question. So I think when we have a 40 year old male, he's got a two day history of lower back pain and shooting pain down the right leg, positive straight leg test. So I think at that point, what they're trying to get out in the question is this is probably a diagnosis. And I saw a couple of people writing it in the chat of sciatica, which is, you know, general, I guess, nerve compression. That's what causes the radiating pain. Very classic in this sort of age group. And the positive straight leg test, again, is very classical of that sciatica type presentation. The reason I've put the second sort of part of the question in, bowel and bladder are intact, no changes in sensation. What I'm trying to hint at there, there's sort of, there's no obvious signs of Porter equinus syndrome, which is a more serious presentation. So in a classic sciatica presentation where it's only been for two days and there's no red flag or alarm features, usually the management is simple analgesia through paracetamol and NSAIDs and physiotherapy. And the majority of patients do improve after that. What we do if they don't improve, I'll talk about in a couple of slides, but I think it's important to know first line management for any sciatic pain without red flags, physiotherapy and simple analgesia. Okay, this is the next question. Again, feel free to type in the chat what you think the answer might be. Yeah, so there's no wrong answers. Feel free to write, write whatever you think it might be. Good, yeah, so we've got uh, a couple of people saying C, a couple of people saying E. Keep, keep going. Awesome, okay. Yeah, I think in this one, the answer is, I guess both, both are good answers, C and E. I think the answer for this one is E. Um, I think it's a medical emergency. And if you sort of see how this question's a little bit different to the previous one, we've still got a middle-aged male. We've still got some back pain um, and we've still got the shooting type pattern of pain. A couple of differences here are firstly the fever, 38.5 degrees, and secondly, the track marks in the cubital fossa. So those are a couple of red flags to us thinking maybe this isn't classic sciatic pain and maybe it's something a little bit more serious. Does anyone in the chat want to have a go at thinking what this condition might be or what, what potential differentials I'm thinking about here and why I want to refer them to hospital straight away? Yeah, so septic arthritis in the vertebral column, someone else has said abscess. Yeah, th those are great thoughts. I think what I'm going for is just an infection in the spine. A, a cervical abscess maybe is probably the most classical of what I've put in this question. So I think the first thing you need to do whenever something such as a cervical abscess presents, it's a medical emergency. So as I said in the earlier slides, anytime there's a medical emergency in a GP setting, refer them to the hospital because the hospital is a much more appropriate place to manage emergencies. Once they're in the hospital, then a few people who said C in the chat, perfect. Then you do the MRI to see if there's an abscess and then obviously surgical management if required. Um, someone just asked me what trap marks in a cubital fossa means. Um, it's sort of a, commonly in a Monash way of saying that they use IV drugs. Um, and that's the source of, that's probably the source of the infection here. Awesome, okay. So a little bit about back pain and a GP perspective to back pain. 
So I think the most common causes of back pain in a GP setting are musculoskeletal, vertical disc pathology, and spondylolysis, which is degenerative osteoarthritis of the spine. So those are the classic presentations you need to get. That's, you know, the sciatica, that's the morning pain and the pain that gets worse through the day in your back with exercise and activity. And that's also the pain where, you know, you're playing a sport, you feel a muscle in your back go out and that it's sort of tended to touch. So those are the classic back pain presentations. There's more serious causes of back pain, which I've put here. These are the ones where when we ask red flag questions or alarm type questions, we're hoping to rule out some of these more serious causes. The screenshot you can see that's from Murtagh's textbook um, and, and it sort of goes through what they think are the more probability diagnosis which I guess are the common things and the more serious diagnosis is which you don't want to miss. So from an exam and OSCE perspective I think it's good to think about it from cluster questions for differentials. So when a patient comes into the GP and says I have back pain obviously you do your classic WWQQAA history I think the next thing you probably want to do is start thinking what are the common differentials that might be at play here and how am I going to rule in or rule out those from a history perspective? So you've got from muscular pain, you've got the classical tenderness to palpation, worse on movement, improves with heat packs. Often there's like a history of a sports type injury or an active injury that's happened. With the sciatic pain, it's similar to that question we had earlier, shooting or burning pain, radiating down, you know, radiating down the arm, radiating down the leg, pins and needles. Both very common and both quite different presentations, as you can see. We then have the degenerative presentation. That's sort of the more OA of the spine type presentation. Because it's degenerative by nature, it's more common in elderly patients. And it's usually worse after activity. And we have the inflammatory pattern of pain. So that's something, for example, in back pain, you might get ankylosing spondylitis. So that's different to the degenerative pattern, where in the inflammatory pattern, it's worse in the morning and it improves with exercise. So it's sort of the opposite. There's associated stiffness and you can have systemic features such as fatigue. And unlike the degenerative, which is more common in the elderly, the inflammatory pattern, usually the onset is more in younger type patients. So we talked about red flags. What are those red flags? So in any GP OSCE of back pain or in an exam setting, if you see one of these, it's an indication that more serious management needs to be done and your classic physiotherapy analgesia is not going to be sufficient. So they either need to be investigated further or go to hospital straight away or have more serious management. So I've sort of grouped them in a way where the first and second are classic features of Porter equina syndrome, where you lose your bowel and bladder function, you have sensory changes, particularly in the perineal region. If either of those are positive, straight to hospital. History of falls of trauma, again, is serious because it can cause like major trauma through the spinal cord. Progressive neurological findings, and in particular, progressive motor weakness. The progressive nature is important because it sort of implies that it's getting worse. So if you have something like sciatica, you hope that it'd probably be getting better over time, not worse. And so if something is getting worse, it means the pathology is not improving when you'd expect it to improve. So there may be a more sinister cause. Things like weight loss and a history of cancer, again, are common from the perspective of have they got a metastasis to the vertebral spine? Common ones such as breast cancer, lung cancer, often go to the spine. And that is often a common cause of the first back pain in an elderly patient. And obviously, if they're hemodynamically unstable or have severe infective symptoms, again, that's sort of a red flag that there might be an infection in the spinal cord. Okay. So when do you treat, when do you image, when do you use conservative management? I think sort of the easiest rule or the easiest way to remember it is if there's no red flags, symptomatic management for the first four to six weeks. So that's your physio, that's your simple analgesia and active recovery. It's really important, particularly from an OSPE perspective. A lot of patients ask, do I just lie in bed? I guess the idea is that's not recommended for back pain with no red flags. You sort of recommend patients try and do as much of their normal activities as possible, mobilize as much as possible and only stop doing something if they feel that there's a clear sort of pain or it's exacerbating their existing pain. The third dot point, if it's not improving after four to six weeks, that's when you consider doing something else. Usually that's a referral for further imaging and seeing them, for example, by a specialist. If it's something like sciatica, it might be a neurosurgeon or a spine surgeon. So in terms of if you do have those red flags, what investigations do you do when? So if you're thinking it's a bony met or an osteoporotic fracture, an X-ray is the best first-line investigation to identify either of those. 
if you're thinking it's quarter of quina or an abscess, that's when you go to hospital straight away, get an MRI. And if you're thinking it's that classic inflammatory pain in a younger patient, such as an angst-spawn type presentation, you probably want to x-ray the SI joint and do a HLA B27 and then refer on. So it's important, I guess, to know that for every red flag, there's not necessarily the same pathway. It depends what the red flag features are and what you think the serious problem is, which then dictates what investigations you want to do next and who you might refer them to next as well. Okay. So next MCQ. And again, whenever people are done, feel free to write in the chat what they think the answer might be. Okay, so a few people are saying B, we might wait for a few more answers and then we'll talk through this one. Okay, good. So I think everyone's sort of pretty strong in the chat saying B. Um, I think this one, I purposefully made it a slightly more challenging question. I think this one, the answer is probably C. Um, and I think the rash was sort of a distractor. So why do I think the answer is C here and not B? So the classic distribution of pain and the type of pain I've described in an elderly individual, it's worse at the end of the day, worse after activities such as gardening, improving on rest. Those are all classical features of mechanical pain, not inflammatory pain. So psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are both inflammatory types of arthritis, whereas osteoarthritis is more mechanical pain. And so this idea of worse at the end of the day, worse with activity, improves on rest, is much more classic for mechanical pain. Also, the crackling or crepitus, again, is a buzzword for osteoarthritis. And the lack of swelling or warmth, I've put that in there to sort of, again, further emphasize that it's probably not an acute inflammatory picture and it's more a mechanical picture. The rash over the knees, your elbows, yeah, the patient probably has psoriasis, but just because a patient has psoriasis doesn't mean they have psoriatic arthritis. And I've put that in there because they've sort of used that in an exam question before to try and trick people up. So I think it's a good thing to be aware of. Um, the pain in the back, again, the reason I put that in there was sort of a distractor for some people, maybe a pick ankylizing spondylitis. Um, it, the pain in the back is probably more just mechanical back pain in an elderly individual with degeneration of the spine. So I think it's important whenever you're thinking about what arthritis it is, the first question should always be, is it inflammatory or is it mechanical? And that sort of guides where your differentials might be and what the treatment might be as well. Okay. So what is osteoarthritis? Very common condition and a big condition in GP. It's one of the major chronic conditions and preventative health conditions. So it's associated, I guess, with the wear and tear of the cartilage. And if you lose cartilage, bone starts to grind against bone, causing the pain, causing the discomfort. The symptoms, so it's sort of classically what was presented in that question. Morning stiffness that's less than 30 minutes, pain that worse on activity, improves with rest. And the major complaint is usually pain. It can be stiffness, but it's less usually, it's not, you know, morning stiffness isn't the primary complaint generally. It's more pain after you've used them. Um, and it can be progressive as well. In terms of the presentation and the signs you might get, some of these, again, are very important from an exam perspective. And you also see a lot of these at a GP. So I think they're quite interesting to note, particularly the Herbidens and Bouchard's notes. So they're sort of nodules on the PIP and DIP. Um, Bouchard's, obviously, you can see here the picture more on the PIP and Herbidens more on the DIP, <clears throat> which is sort of the bottom picture I've put there. You can also have the squaring of the wrist joint and there's an absence of the typical features of synovitis. So there's usually limited or no joint line tenderness, no ulnar styloid tenderness, no stress tenderness, and not much swelling or bulkiness. And all of those featured as features I've got there are much more in the inflammatory picture and much less in a mechanical picture. So I think from the history and examination, you can have a pretty good idea of whether it's inflammatory or whether you think it's mechanical. And from a GP perspective, particularly for fourth year, I think they're much more likely to test OA than any of the inflammatory arthritis. Because usually when you have an inflammatory arthritis, when that's sort of suspected or diagnosed, they usually refer to a rheumatologist. Okay, so how do you diagnose it? It's generally a clinical diagnosis. You don't need to image the joint. Usually when they tell you this classical story, you see a couple of the signs, it, it, that's usually it. Um, you can start treating it straight away. And usually it's treated primarily by the GP and it's usually diagnosed by the GP as well. 
you can do an x-ray which shows i guess buzzword features the acronym is loss so if we have a look at the diagram i've got here you can sort of see if we look at the right side first what does it mean by loss of joint space? You can sort of see that it's asymmetrical, right? There's a lot of joint space on one side of the knee and not a lot of joint space on the other side. And that narrowing on one side is what it means when it says loss of joint space. You can also see osteophytes, subchondral sclerosis and subchondral cysts. So what does all that mean? Subchondral sclerosis is how you can see close to the joint line here, there's sort of a bit of more whiteness you can see as opposed to the rest of the bone. There's a lot more whiteness at the joint line. That's the subchondral sclerosis. Subchondral cysts are basically cysts within the bone. You can sort of see where my cursor is, that's a subchondral cyst. And osteophytes are sort of projections of bone that are not usually there. So you might get an X-ray and an osteo to interpret. If you do get an osteoarthritis X-ray, it's pretty classical, and it usually will have at least one or two of these classical findings. And they're, I think, relatively easy to pick up on X-ray as well. So when do you do an X-ray? Usually you don't do it um, in an exam setting the answer will probably be clinical diagnosis. But I guess if there's an unclear diagnosis, if it's sort of a mixed picture with a little bit of inflammatory features, a little bit of mechanical features, or if you're considering operating on the joint to fix or make the osteoarthritis symptomatically better, then you'd probably x-ray it to see its severity. So how do you manage it? Um, first line is usually always in osteoarthritis, simple analgesia through, non, uh, through pharmacological methods and then non-pharmacological methods as well. So you can do things like CBT, physiotherapy for non-pharmacological, and for the simple analgesia, paracetamols and NSAIDs. There's limited evidence for the paracetamol in the new RACGP guidelines, um, but in practice, I think you'll see a lot of people do still prescribe that as the first sort of pain relief medication. The big point, I think, in the pharmacological management is that opioids are like, unequivocally recommended against by the RACGP, um, and that sort of throughout and consistent, their guidelines specifically say no opioids. So it's something to remember for exams in OSCEs that if a patient wants opioids or a patient thinks that an opioid is gonna make osteoarthritis better, the RACGP says no. When do you consider operative management, which is usually replacing the joint? It generally works better the larger the joint. So the hip is the best than the knee um, in terms of outcomes. And the hip is probably the one where you'll find stories of patients come to the GP and say, it's changed my life. Um, and the smaller the joint gets, the less likely operative management is to be effective. Um, usually you only consider surgery if the earlier things on the slide don't work. So if it's refractory to all the non-pharmacological and simple analgesia measures, and also it has to have a severe impact on quality of life. So impacting things like sleep, not being able to do the activities you used to be able to do because of pain or limitation in the movement. And usually, you know, there's a lot of long public hospital waiting lists, so up to a year, two years. So a lot of patients don't get access to the joint replacement straight away. There often is a bit of weight associated with that. Okay, so those are the two big MSK conditions. I'd know them both in good detail and both have RACGP specific guidelines for them. So I'd read those guidelines, understand when do you image, when do you not, and understand what the management pathways are for both of them. Um, they come up a lot in MCQs and they also come up in OSCEs as well. Um, the next conditions I have are, are sort of still MSK conditions, but they're much more buzzwords. So you don't need to know them in that much detail. As long as you have a decent idea of what's going on from the clinical presentation, that's sort of it. You don't probably don't need to read any guidelines or go into too much depth about them. So we'll try and race through these next few. I just wanted to go back pain and osteoarthritis are important. They're common and highly examinable. So know them well. Okay. Rotator cuff tendinopathy, um, you would have seen a lot of this. You learned a lot about it in first and second year when you did those clean skills tutorials about shoulder exam. I've got there which sort of movement impacts which rotator cuff tendon specifically. So, you know, you've got usually the supraspinatus is abduction, subscapularis is internal rotation, and infraspinatus and teres minor are external rotation. I think it's worth knowing that, but in practice, often patients have, you know, it's not this clear cut. It might be a little bit of abduction, a little bit of internal rotation. Um, usually it's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need to image and the treatment is conservative. So physiotherapy, analgesia and strengthen the shoulder joint. Okay, so here's an MCQ on a similar related topic. Again, whenever you think you have an answer, just chuck it in the chat. Yeah, so a couple of people saying D, we'll just wait 
to see what other people think. Yeah. Okay. So I think pretty much everyone seems to be saying D, which is perfect. Um, adhesive capsulitis, which is the other way to, I guess, say that it's frozen shoulder. I think the reason I put this question next in the PowerPoint is to highlight how the presentations between adhesive capsulitis and supraspinatus or another rotator cuff, cuff tendinopathy are different. And they often like to sort of tease out those differences through their questions. With the adhesive capsulitis, it's much more likely that you get, I guess the buzzword is limitation in all range of motion. So it's global limitation in the way you can move the shoulder. It's more common in females and it's more common in patients with diabetes, which is why those two elements of the question have been put there. Um, usually there is, I guess, pain associated with it, but the buzzword you'll see is you, you have difficulty moving the shoulder in all ranges of motion, where with the, I guess, rotator cuff tendinopathies, they more sort of focus on one particular type of movement. So for example, the painful arc that's causing problems. A little bit about it. As I said, the diabetic female, I'll put that in quotes there. The only reason that's there is because Monash loves using, you know, epi as a way to set up questions. And so knowing that that's the most common epidemiological group is, I think, helpful to know. Usually, again, it's a clinical diagnosis and you don't need to do anything to diagnose it. You can ultrasound it, which will show the pathology, but it's not usually needed. And again, management similar, physiotherapy, analgesia, and you can inject the joint with steroids if the patient wants it. And it usually resolves within a period of 24 months with the worst pain being in the first nine months. Okay, next question. So this one's a little bit harder because I haven't made it as obvious, I guess, what the diagnosis was. And I also haven't said what's the next step? I've sort of gone straight to the management. So I'll give people a little bit more time for this one, but I want to see if people have a go in the chat. And if you can, feel free to message the chat publicly so everyone can see what people think. Just, I guess, helps, helps everyone feel more confident to answer as well, I think. Yeah, awesome. So I've got quite a few people saying D. Um, I think that's correct. So the first question I have in this one, and again, feel free to call it out or write it in the chat. What do people think this condition might be? Okay, good. So someone said in the chat PMR, someone said trochanteric bursitis. Okay, we'll wait for a few more people to respond. Yeah, graded trochanteric pain syndrome, someone said. Okay. Someone said OA, good. Okay. So I think we've got a range of answers. A few people have messaged me directly as well saying OA, PMR, trochanteric bursitis. So we've got quite a spectrum of sort of, I guess, presentations and thoughts on what this might be. I think there's a couple of buzzwords here which indicate that this is probably a case of trochanteric bursitis, which is also called graded trochanteric pain syndrome. So it's basically just the same word for two different things. Or two same things, sorry, the same way of saying, two different ways of saying the same thing, sorry. So... I guess a couple of the hints in this question as to why this might be trochanteric bursitis. Um, it's classical on you know one side of the hip being tender to touch and the buzzword is not being able to sleep on that side. So when you sort of put any pressure on that trochanteric bursa and it causes pain and difficulty with sleep, that's kind of classical of a trochanteric bursitis presentation. Um, someone has just told me PMR. I think that's good. PMR is more an inflammatory type pattern and usually they do have hip pain, which is good. Um, but they also often have pain in this sort of shoulder region as well. And it's generally a more inflammatory pattern of pain. With OA, again, that's usually not tender to touch per se. That's more mechanical type pain where it's worse at the end of the day, worse after use. And you don't have that classical, when you turn to that side in bed, it's not going to cause a sudden acute pain, which stops your sleep. That's sort of very classical of trochanteric bursitis. Again, first line management, as we say in the question, is basically... You have the PRN ibuprofen, you have the PRN paracetamol, you try physiotherapy. Pretty much any MSK condition, unless it's inflammatory, goes through that pattern. If that doesn't work, for trochanteric bursitis, the answer which a lot of people said, which is great, is a steroid injection. Basically, you're trying to reduce the local inflammation in that bursa. And if you bring down the inflammation, the hope is that over time, the symptoms tend to resolve. So I think, again, it's worth knowing what trochanteric bursitis is. It's worth knowing the buzzwords. And it's worth knowing that the escalation in management is usually just a steroid injection into that region itself. Okay, next one. Again, this one's very buzzwordy and you don't need to know too much about it. 
And again, feel free to write in the chat what you think it is. Yeah, so a few people messaging me C, which is good. Okay. Um, this one's challenging, as I said. I, I don't expect people to know this one. The answer is A, Moralgia Parasthetica. It, again, it's very, very buzzwordy. Um, pain in just one area of the thigh, <clears throat> in particular, the lateral aspect of the thigh. They often get tingling. You know, some people describe it like a sensation that they have a phone in their pocket and it's always on vibrate. So there's always some sort of sensations going down the lateral aspect of the thigh. It's an sort of the way I've tried to set up the question is to highlight that it's an, a very isolated issue. So they have that vibrating, they have that tingling sensation, but really nothing else. No motor weakness, no shooting pains down to the calves or into the feet. And it's just in that one area of the thigh. It's caused by compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, and I guess it, it's just something to know. It's a buzzword. It does come up on exams and it's worth knowing what the condition is, where the pain is usually distributed. And I guess a little bit about, you know, if you get this in an exam, what might the patient have and what sort of diagnosis are we thinking? I think the most common answer in the chat was lumbar radiculopathy. Um, that was good. I think what I was going for partic in particular here with a lack of, you know, radiating shooting type pain, it was just tingling down one aspect of the thigh. I think it was very classical of neurology or parasthetica. Okay, next question. Hopefully this one's a little bit easier. Again, very common condition in a GP setting. I've got the picture there. Um, what do we think it is? Yep, awesome. Um, everyone said Baker cyst, which is perfect. Um, it's sort of at the back of the patella, a little bit of a swelling. It's very classical, the Baker cyst. Um, the other sort of ones I've got there, some of them were sort of just there because I had to make up five options. Obviously, super patella bursitis, that's on the front, not on the back. So that's how you probably rule that one out. Knee OA, again, that, that's sort of not really relevant here. And rheumatoid arthritis, again, not really relevant here. The one I think is important to consider is a popliteal aneurysm <clears throat> because the popliteal artery sort of runs in that region as well. And if there's an aneurysm, you can have a bulge. So if at all you're suspecting that there's an aneurysm in the popliteal artery and it can present like this, you probably want to ultrasound the area. Um, if you're not really suspecting that, you know, there's no clinical features to suggest that it's not pulsatile at all, you can just make it a clinical diagnosis as a Baker's cyst. But I think it's just to be aware of, if at all, that there's a pulsatile nature to it, or for whatever reason, the patient has certain risk factors that might predispose them to an aneurysm, it's important to just keep that differential diagnosis in mind. Um, a, B, and A, D, and E were all sort of distractors. I thought C was probably a reasonable differential to have for a lump at the back of the knee. Okay, next MCQ. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay perfect so i've got a few c's and a few a's perfect okay um so what i was going for here with this particular condition was carpal tunnel syndrome um and the answer is c clinical diagnosis um what we notice is often in msk the gp perspective if there's not life-threatening it's usually a clinical diagnosis so if in doubt you know you don't really know what the condition is in an exam and you don't think it's that serious like you know you don't think there's any obvious red flags very clinical diagnosis because more often than not that's how they're diagnosed and you only investigate or image if it doesn't get better after a period of time so a couple of buzzwords here as to why this might have been carpal tunnel syndrome more common in females again more common in patients with heart failure because fluid overload can cause compression of the median nerve and the sort of classic findings of you know weakness tingling and the thumb or the thena distribution and muscle wasting in that area is very classical and obviously a tinnels test is one that is used which i think you would have gone through in second year when you're doing clean skills tutorials um, that's sort of classical in carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, next one. Again, very common. Some people might even have had this themselves. Um, yeah. Okay, and again, feel free in the chat, if, you, if you're not sure what the answer is, um, feel free even just to write what you think the condition might be because it is a little bit of a weird condition um, and it's not one that you might not have come across before. Yeah, good. So a few people in the chat are writing ganglion cyst, which is, that, that's, a, that's exactly what I was going for. That's a classical picture of a ganglion cyst. Um, and hopefully if you guys get GP placement and you, know, you can see patients face to face, hopefully you might come across one of them. They're very common and everyone goes to the GP for them. So it's something you hopefully will see. In terms of the first line management, usually observation, a lot of them disappear over time. 
Um, you can also consider doing more invasive things such as draining it or even removing it surgically. The problem with draining them is a lot of them come back. So more often than not, what's recommended is you just observe over time and usually they disappear. And the second line, I guess, would be the drainage. The third line would be surgery. Okay, next one. Only a few more left and then we'll get onto the oskies very briefly. Perfect, yep, I see a few people writing C in the chat. Um, yeah, this is again, very, very buzzwordy. It's important to know a lot of these feet conditions. So um, here we've got Morton's neuroma. The first thing I'd say before I explain why, I think it's important that you also know what seismoiditis is and you know what a metatarsal stress factor is and how their presentations would be a little bit different. So what sort of place or where in the feet do they impact and where does Morton's neuroma impact? The other two, I think they're important to know. I haven't put them as an option choice, but Kohlberg's and Frieden, Freiberg's osteochondritis so something like that. Just search them both up. They're two, again, very niche feet condition, but feet conditions are very common in GP and they like to test them because it's really, you know, niche GP knowledge, which shows whether or not you've studied MSK. So just something to be aware of. Know a lot of the common feet conditions and where they cause pain. And they're all generally a little bit different. So Morton's neuroma, the buzzwords here with third and fourth metatarsals, that sort of burning pain between them, that's a buzzword for Morton's neuroma. I wouldn't recommend learning how to treat it, how to investigate it. Just know if you see the buzzword, what's the diagnosis? Okay, next one. Again, still focusing on the feet. Awesome, yep, so a lot of people writing E in the chat, which is spot on. Um, this is, a, I guess, another buzzword description of plantar fasciitis. The way, I guess, from the question to not, first of all, where it's impacting in the foot, this is sort of more on the plantar surface as opposed to a particular toe or a particular distribution of the metatarsals. That's the first hint, I guess. The second hint is that it's worse in the morning and the first few steps out of bed, that's an absolute buzzword for plantar fasciitis. Um, it's because the fascia sort of, as you walk, it sort of starts to break down a little bit and the pain starts to go away. So worse in the morning, worse with the first few steps and gets better after walking on the plantar surface of the foot, think plantar fasciitis. Again, don't worry about how to treat, how to diagnose with investigations or anything. Just know these are the buzzwords. This is a clinical presentation. Okay. So a very brief summary um, for MSK, and obviously this is oversimplifying things, but if there's no red flags, rest, analgesia, physiotherapy, and review them in four to six weeks. For pretty much any MSK condition that's non-inflammatory and that doesn't have a red flag. So things like non-specific back pain, straight away go to this. If there's red flag features, image plus or minus hospital, plus or minus referral. So if you think there's a bony met, you might consider an x-ray. If you think it's quarter of they're going to hospital. But if there's a red flag, you're not gonna do the rest analgesia physiotherapy. You're gonna do something more. And what that is, is a little bit dependent on what you think the actual condition might be. If you're suspecting an inflammatory disease, so rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, angst bond, refer them to a rheumatologist who will manage that condition. And the last point here, I guess you would have learned this in third year as well, but an acutely red, hot and swollen joint is septic arthritis until proven otherwise. And you want to aspirate that joint, get the fluid and see what's in the fluid. Okay. So again, if you get a red hot, acutely swollen joint, that's a medical emergency if you're thinking septic arthritis. So that's, you probably refer them to hospital to get that joint aspirate. Okay, so very briefly, just in the last five minutes or so on OSCEs. I think all you really need to know, I think for OSCEs is Murtagh's 10 steps. This is a picture, I've taken this straight from the Monash GP notes. Um, I'd memorize this and I think it's important you know all of these steps off by heart and you're very comfortable doing all of these steps. The classical GP OSCE, I guess, is three minutes to four minutes, take a history and think of what you think the most obvious diagnosis is. And then five, four to five minutes, explain the management. And when they say explain the management, they just mean go through Murtagh's 10 steps. Given that you have such a short time, often in the GP OSCEs for the histories, what you'll often find is that the histories aren't difficult. The diagnosis is obvious and they're not trying to trick you up. And you often also don't have time to go through your classic history structure. So you might not get to all the questions you want to ask. And you, know, you might not get through diet, exercise, lifestyle. So you kind of have to be a little bit more selective in what you ask in a GP history because the majority of the GP time that they want you to do is go through these 10 steps. 
and they want you to know them. They want you to cover all of them and they want you to be comfortable introducing these ideas. Often what you find is that it's a little bit awkward sometimes to include all of these points. So, you know, like establish the patient's knowledge and then establish the patient's attitudes. Sometimes it can be a little bit weird doing that. You might feel a bit uncomfortable, you know, you told them, I think you have osteoarthritis. And then it might feel a little bit weird asking all these follow-up questions before actually explaining what it is and how to treat it. What I'd say is it's important you follow these steps and it's important you get comfortable introducing these questions in a way that isn't awkward. And I think the best way to do that is practice. So my biggest tip for GP OSCEs is when you're practicing, think about the common conditions that you might get. You know, things like diabetes, things like hypertension, high cholesterol, back pain, osteoarthritis. And you'll see what all those common ones are, you know, eczema, any sort of rash as well. Think about it. What cluster questions might you ask for it? How do you get to a diagnosis quickly? And then for the rest of the OSCE, how are you going to do this? How are you going to explain it to the patient in simple language? What resources are you going to refer to? them? What are ways to prevent it happening again that don't require medicine? So I think if you think about GP OSCEs, all you really need to do, I think, is have this 10 steps in mind. And any common condition or any practice OSCE you do, once you finish it, make sure you have these 10 steps and make sure if you didn't know what to do for these 10 steps, afterwards, you do know what to do. I think the last thing I'd say is have fixed responses for some of them. So like preventative health and medicine, there's some things you say for every elderly patient. There's some things you might say for females of a reproductive age. There's some things you might say for young adults. So have, I guess, a little bit of a checklist in mind to help yourself that when you have a particular patient or a particular age group, in Murtagh's 10 steps, when you're thinking about other preventative opportunities, what might you say? And this is a sort of, a, just a very brief list. There's a lot of other things you can think about too, but have your own responses fixed for this particular situation. I think given the OSCE is a pass fail, I would focus more on the GP perspective, the written exam, just in general, not just for MSK, but the RAC GP guidelines are really helpful. And particularly for the big conditions, I'd read the guidelines, know how to diagnose the condition and know exactly what sort of management steps are required and when you escalate and when you don't escalate. So hopefully this has been helpful. Thank you so much all for your time and best of luck for your exams.